spring engagement of our ethical engineering series, uh, Engineering in Iraq's Garden of Eden with Dr. Azam Awash. Uh, this event is a collaboration between ASC UC Irvine and AAES UC Irvine. Uh, my name is Keenan, and I'm the outgoing president of ASC UCI. And I'm Martha, I'm the president for AAES. Thanks. In this second lecture of our two-part series, Dr. Alwash will describe the challenges that face our marshes and habitats, and will share engineering solutions that can build sustainable economies. He will present ideas, major reforms, and projects that could alleviate the inevitable stresses caused by increased water demand. And Dr. Alwash hopes to reframe our conversations to foster codependence, shifting conversations from whose water is it to how can we share better. Uh, we'd also like to remind everybody that the, this talk will be available later on YouTube, and the playback for the first talk is in the chat. So if you were here last session, uh, you already know this, but for those of you who are new, I will introduce our guest speaker again. Um, Dr. Zam Alwash is an internationally recognized environmental advocate. He was raised around the Mesopotamian marshlands of southern Iraq, and studied civil engineering at CSU Fullerton and USC. After practicing for 20 years in Orange County, Dr. Alwash returned to the marshlands of his childhood, which were drained by the regime of Saddam Hussein to deprive his opposition of cover. In 2004, he founded the nonprofit Nature Iraq to advocate for the environment. Dr. Alwash's hydraulic restoration plan was ultimately fruitful, and his work has been featured in outlets such as the New York Times, The Guardian, PBS's Nature Documentary Series, and TEDx. He's currently working with Nature Iraq and the, Uni the American University of Iraq in Sulaimani to advance, pe advance peace in the Middle East through Water Sustainability Corporation. Um, before we turn it over to Dr. Alwash, um, this session will be a little bit more interactive. So if you have anything to ask or to share, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand and one of us will call on you. So let's begin. Uh, thank you, Martina. I'm gonna share my screen now. And like you said, this, uh, this, uh, Hold on, something. Are you able to see my screen? Can you see my screen or? Yes, it looks good. Okay. So good afternoon, uh, Ramadan Mubarak. Uh, I suppose we should have thought about the timing of this uh, uh, a little bit better. I, I completely forgot that the second series is going to be, the second lecture is going to be in the Ramadan. So. Um, I am at fault here, nobody's else's fault, I should have reminded you. Uh, but um, hopefully uh, people can watch and, and have breakfast. This is the second day of Ramadan, so it's kind of hard. Anyway, uh, listen, this, uh, let me recap a uh, uh, few highlights of uh, what was covered last time, so that for those of you who are not here, uh, don't kind of come in the middle and, and don't understand what's going on. Uh, the most important thing uh, that I wanted to convey last time was that the marshes of Iraq are essentially a natural retention basin for the waters of the Tigris and Euphrates, that in fact they were dried by Saddam Hussein, and they were reflooded. I want to make the point that they were reflooded and not restored. There's a huge difference between reflooding and restoration. Restoration implies that to return to its natural conditions. It has not returned to its natural conditions uh, simply because of the dams uh, that have been built upstream, which have caused a huge uh, disruption to the hydropulse of the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, as you can see by this hydrograph of the Euphrates River and this hydrograph of the Tigris River. The, the result of the reflooding but not the returning of the pulse is that the biodiversity of the marshes are changing or have changed, are in the process of changing because nothing in nature is constant. Everything is actually subject to change. The only constant in nature is change. The uh, biodiversity of the marshes as it existed before depended on this pulse. And now uh, what's happening as a result of this change in the hydraulic reg regime is that some species that required having clear 
thick uh, or deep waters are not doing as well as uh, say the more robust species. Carp is replacing the natural fish uh, uh, that in is indigenous to this to this region, and uh, that's okay. It's not. It's not. It's not that. It's 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 uh, it's regrettable. Again, everything is subject to change. Um, the infrastructure of the the, the other uh, main point that I wanted to convey last time was that the entire infrastructure. I'm going to go back a little bit here. The entire infrastructure of uh, the management of water resources of Iraq was based on flood control. But the flood controllers, the engineers of my father's generation and even my generations, think of floods as something that is very bad for uh, the cities. And they are bad for the cities. But what we did not realize until a bit too late is that, in fact, the floods were renewal force for the farms especially those farms that are flood irrigated that have salt accumulates from the, from the evaporation. Uh, so majority of the uh, lakes in Iraq, short of the marshes, are in fact artificial lakes designed for flood control. We lose something like 8 billion cubic meters of water a year. That's 8 billion, that's 8,000 million cubic meters of water a year to evaporation. That's a huge, 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 huge amount of water. Um, that um, a country like Georgia, where I am right now, their entire annual budget of water is 1 billion. We evaporate eight of those uh, billions up in the air. Um, so these are the, uh, the main issues uh, that the marshes have not been restored, that have been reflooded. There are dams upstream that are affecting the hydro pulse, but there's also other dangers happening, dangers that the whole world is facing, that is, uh, climate change. Climate change is causing the, 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 the water to rise in the, in the Gulf. That means the salt wedge or the salt water of the Gulf is actually penetrating inside the, the, the Shat al-Arab. Shat al-Arab, let's go to, down to this. Uh, Shat al-Arab is, is, uh, is, the, is the exit of the Tigris and Euphrates. So the marshes, some models show that the marshes are going to be covered with about one to two meters of salt water somewhere around 2050, if in fact the climate change does not change or that we don't reduce the CO2 production and, and, and the, the poles continue to melt. That's one danger. The other danger is that in fact climate change, some of the models showing that the temperature in the region could go to as much as 70 degrees centigrade. What's that in Fahrenheit so you can understand? Over 130, I think 140 or somewhere around there. That means you, you go outside for 10 minutes and you're dead of heat stroke. Uh, that means it's not livable in the summer. Um, so that's, that's a danger. On top of that, because the world is actually moving away uh, uh, from uh, fossil fuel, uh, and the fact that Iraq's economy, entire economy is based for the last 50 years on selling oil, and buying food is a rentier state economy, typical rentier state, state economy. Uh, that is uh, essentially meaning that Iraq's income is going to be reduced slowly, but surely over the next 10 to 20 years, 30 years. By 2050, we're supposed to be going to zero carbon. That means by 2050, there is no market for our oil, uh, i.e. we will become uh, bankrupt. Um, and a third perfect storm coming at the same time is that today Iraq is 40 million people. At the rate we're going, which is about 3%, 2.8 to 3%, by 2030, this is around the corner, 10 years from now, you're going to be mid-management by then, uh, Iraq will be 53 million. And if we continue with that rate, we will be 80 million by 2050. So here is it. Climate change is causing the area to be uh, hotter and not livable. Uh, oil is cheaper, and i.e. your income is less, and the number of stakeholders is increasing. Perfect storm. What do you think the result is going to be? I can tell you, if we look at history, there's going to be migration. First, migration from the farms to the cities. The cities are not designed to take care of all that many people. That means there's going to be crowding, there's going to be lack of services, shortages. On top of that, the fact that there's no income, that means that, this, that there's going to be even a huger, uh, bigger, a bigger impact on the budget. That means 
extremism. That means also human waves. I don't know how old were you when, when the Syrian crisis started, but about seven, eight years, we saw huge waves of migrants coming out of Syria and Northern Iraq when ISIS came over to Northern Iraq. And they went in Turkey and then Turkey told the European Union, hey, we need help. Union, European Union did not give them help. So they let everybody leave and we had, we had waves and waves of, of, uh, of migrants going and trying to go to Europe. Uh, the United States Army uh, in 2011, although the government had not recognized climate change as an official, uh, 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 as something that is real, uh, the fact is the United States Army identified climate change as one of the biggest threats uh, to the United States interests because of the potential migration and all the instability that that migration is going to, co to, to, to cause. Now, some people will say, you know, the migrants need not go to Europe. I submit to you and in, in, a, in a recent interview or actually a workshop, I told, I told them, I told the people that I don't know where the migrants are going to go, but I assure you they are not going to be going to China or India. They have their own problems there as well. So I think this, this migration wave is definitely going to Europe. Um, and so it's in the interest of Europe as well as the West to help Iraq bridge this gap and reform. So. So what are the solutions? I've, I've just described to you problems and, and the, problem, the problems are, are almost, almost um, um, unresolvable. But before I go in, I can tell you that the problems technically are very easy to resolve. What is missing from the mix is the political will. Okay? So rest assured, there are solutions. <laughs> but what we need is the, the politicians to understand that uh, the zero sum game uh, uh, must must be over. Now, you saw the you saw the, the picture that shows all the dams upstream, huge dams, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, sustainable energy people uh, think that dams are in fact the the silver bullet. And in many ways, all engineering projects have positives and have negatives. Dams on the whole have a lot of positives, but there are negatives. And that is one of, one of the negatives, as I, as I showed you, is in fact the impact that it has, the dams have on the cycle of life in Southern Iraq. Uh, some people may argue that in fact, we have more water for irrigation in the summer than we used to before. That's true, but also that means there's going to be a lot more evaporation, a lot more sal salinization than used to happen before. Um, and so this picture that you see on your screen is, I, I got it from the, from the internet. Um, somehow I was reading and I read about peace pipelines and I thought, what the hell is that peace pipelines? It turned out to be a Turkish project back from the 60s and 70s. This is before the invention of reverse osmosis to create sweet water. They actually created a plan to dam the, the, the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates and sell water. They even at one point in time were selling water to Israel in plastic pontoons, i.e., uh, like a like a like a water mattress, like a mat, an, an, a, a, a an air mattress that you put on on your on your floor. They fill it with water and they drag those to 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 Israel um, at a loss, at, at in fact at a loss, uh, only to 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 establish the the uh, principle that water can be bought and sold as opposed to being a free right or a right of uh, a human right. Uh, and look at these pipelines. The pipelines actually bypass Iraq and they go to Kuwait. Well, in fact, it's a lot easier to transfer water from Shat al-Arab to Kuwait with one small pipeline. And that pipeline goes all the way to Abu Dhabi, Qatar, and all the way to Oman, to Muscat. Um, and of course, uh, on the other hand, it goes to Palestine, Jordan, Israel, and Mecca and Medina. This is from the 1970s. Again, before reverse osmosis became a technology that was intended for the moonshot, uh, and it became a more a more um, economic uh, process or more economic than the than putting in these pipelines. So, so the idea of the peace pipelines died, but not the idea of dams. The dams have been built uh, in the 90s to create hydro hydroelectricity, um, and and since the middle 90s. We've had a discussion uh, between Iraq and Turkey on whose water this is. So, for those of you who are not uh, who are not uh, 
uh, informed about international law on water. In 1990, there's, there's a lot of history goes going back to, from the 1940s through 1997, but there's a 1997 Convention on Water, uh, which is based on uh, uh, three major, or actually two, two major principles. Do no harm and equitable and reasonable utilization, i.e. countries have the right to build dams, but they have no right to cause, to cause harm down, down, downstream. They have to cooperate. Uh, and uh, division of water has to be based on equity and reasonable use. These are very vague terms. And for, the, for those of you who are gonna become lawyers, you can make millions out of uh, uh, interpreting what words mean. Um, um, and there's also provisions for ecosystem uses of water, but this whole 1997 convention, although uh, ratified by something like 160 countries by now, it has no force of, of implementation. It's basically based on uh, principles of friendship and, and peacemaking. Uh, it does not have United Nations Security Council teeth behind it. No chapter six, no chapter seven sanctions. Uh, so it's just major principles and you can, you're reading around the world, you can see that right now there are tensions, increasing tensions between Egypt and Ethiopia on the uh, Renaissance da Dam. Um, in, Egypt is in fact threatening to hit the dam before it gets filled with, with weapons so that it, it will destroy the dam. And, and you know, these are, these are, uh, these are, this is, this is a tough issue in the middle of, of, of our region. I mean, we don't need yet one more layer of, of tension and, and we have we have definitely a lot of tensions and and, and water is setting about to become uh, uh, more of a tension so 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 the discussion with between Turkey and Iraq from the 70s through the 90s even today is based on whose water whose uh, whose uh, whose water it is oh I dropped this international law by the way is only applied on the weak international law is a beautiful concept but only the weak have to comply. The strong basically set the rules and they don't have to apply. They don't have to comply. United States being one, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, there are many United Nations uh, Security Council resolutions on the Palestinian-Israeli issue, but very few of them have, have, been, have been implemented. Um, on Iraq, it was implemented. On Iran, right now it's being implemented. So the weak, must comply with international law. The strong do not really need to comply with, with international law. Is that right? Of course it's not right, but that's reality. Turkey in this instance is NATO. What is Iraq going to do? Attack dams in Turkey and get into a war with, with NATO? No, thank you. That's not gonna happen. So, so the discussion over the last 30 years, 40 years has been has been uh, based on whose water this is. Iraq claims that it has clay tablets from 3500 BC that shows that it was the first to develop the, uh, uh, the resources of the Tagus and Euphrates. And that's true, that's history. Uh, Iraq's problem, as I told you, was based on water control, flood control. We had too much water. Uh, and all of a sudden now we are living a reality where we have not enough water, we have added conditions. Um, so I suggest, just like I suggested last time when I talked to you that the discussion about climate change is being affected by fossil fuel or not, that was a useless discussion that took 20 years to settle. I have always said it doesn't really matter. All you have to look at fossil fuel is a very inefficiently charged battery that took Earth three and a half billion years to charge and we have consumed half of it in, in, in 150 years. Doesn't it behoove us to save it uh, and save what's, uh, what's, what, what's left of that battery by conserving it and creating new sources of energy than to debate whether, whether this climate change is caused by CO2 or not. Oh, okay, that, that, that debate is over. Now we're working towards, towards the solution, maybe a bit too late, but we're working towards the solution. The same uh, uh, issue applies between Turkey and Iraq. I tell Iraqis, do not keep on demanding your international rights. You are right, you have international rights, but you're weak. You're not gonna be able to get the, the international community 
to sympathize with you and help you in getting your rights. We need to change the discussion from whose water this is to how we can cooperate. And these ideas, I assure you, the leaders of Iraq understand these ideas and endorse these ideas that I'm telling you. I have reached the president of Iraq. I have reached the prime minister, the previous prime minister, the one before whom I did not reach because he's Islamist. But everywhere I go, when I'm talking to technical people, they understand that I am talking logic. But unfortunately, logic and emotions kind of like oil and water. They don't mix. When you tell to Iraq, to Iraqis, uh, Iraqis we, need, we need to compromise. How can you compromise what is right? You're selling your historic Christ. No, I'm not selling historic Christ. I am telling you, you need to be pragmatic and realize that Turkey has as much right to this water as you do. What you need to do is uh, work together on the management of the water of the Tigris and Euphrates. And I assure you, if you manage it together with modern methods, there is enough for everybody to share. There is no need for this to become a zero sum game. Turkey cannot hold all the water, right? I mean, you can build reservoirs and reservoirs and reservoirs and you have evaporation, but eventually the water is going to have to go, right? But why? Why does Iraq, for example, loses 8 billion cubic meters of water uselessly? at this point in time, when in fact there is storage space upstream. Um, the problem is there is lack of trust here. Iraq does not trust Turkey, Turkey does not trust Iraq, Turkey and Iran uh, are historic, and those of you who have are your science, so, so you probably did not study history as much as we do. Here we live history. Uh, uh, here, here is where history is written, guys. <laughs> uh, 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 Persia, Turkey and Iraq have been, have been similar to, to Germany, France, and Britain in competition for power and dominance in this region, right? Persia was fighting Greece and then was fighting the Uthmans. Turkey, uh, Iraq, uh, Iran uh, occupied Iraq 2,500 years ago. Uh, to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a zero sum game, and it's been zero sum game. So there is lack of trust. Uh, there is, and, and, and here, and frequently I'm asked, what is the difference between East and West? I say, here we are busy discussing the past and the West is busy envisioning the future. Uh, and so, yes, I, I see somebody raising their hands. Yes, is that, I'm assuming that's me you're talking about? Yes, 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 yes sir. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested by your bringing into all of this geopolitics and I'm wondering um, whether, and this is completely hypothetical, but what would the technical and geopolitical situation look like if the countries themselves that are affected by, or that the water of any river runs through is based off of watershed maps rather than arbitrarily drawn geographic boundaries? Oh, God, that would be a perfect world with the water shortages, wouldn't it? Unfortunately, whoever put the, uh, the line on the maps did not even think about water. I mean, you look at the watershed of Iraq, yeah. I wish, uh, if you wish, the uh, watershed of the Tigris and Euphrates. 60% of the watershed of the Tigris is in Iraq. But that's only rain. The snow falls on the mountains, and the mountains are half in Iran and half in Turkey. And uh, if, if the entire watershed, or not the entire, if, if the majority of the watershed is in, within one country, then, then there's no problem. We can all work. But in Iraq, I remind you, there's, there's actually the northern part of Iraq is Kurdish, uh -huh. and the southern part of Iraq is Arab. Even if it's within one country, there's no guarantee in life that says this country is going to be together for the rest of its right. eternity. And right. so, and so there, are, there are tensions even within Iraq. Take the United States, take the Colorado River. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I live in, Ari I live in Arizona, so I know exactly what you're talking about. So, so you know, the, 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 regardless of the boundaries, there will be stakeholders, there will be tensions, there will be more demands. Um, but I guess what I'm, what I'm wondering is, um, I'm curious, maybe you're going to get to this, but I'm wondering um, what the possibilities are for the development of economic ties, not at a national level, but at a sub at a subnational level. 
and whether that actually leads to uh, change at a national level. Focus on the, the subnational that leads to change at the national. Uh, that's definitely part of the solution. And it's an essentially a return to the past in a way, because we used to have Emirates. We didn't, before we had Iraq, we had the Sumerians in the South of Iraq, we had the Babylonians in the middle of Iraq, we have the Assyrians. And so, yeah, it, it, eventually there's going to be, uh, I hope, a Swiss-like uh, 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 compact between the various regions, self-governance in the region, uh, plus cooperation confederation uh, over the overall. And let's, let's talk about the pieces that are gonna bring us to that solution. As I told you, we lose 8 billion cubic meters of water uh, in Iraq from major lakes. Uh, uh, and there's no trust between Iraq and, 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 and Turkey. So remember, Trust, but verify. No, you're too young. You weren't born in the Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm suggesting here is that we have a dam in Iraq that was built in 1980, 1980s in the middle of Iraq, Iran war. And the reason why it was built in a hurry in the wrong place is because there were no dams upstream. And if there was a big flood, the, the, the war zone between Iraq and Iran, the front lines would, ha would have been flooded and Iraq would have lost the, the war. So they built a dam, a huge dam called the Mosul Dam very quickly over in an area that they knew is underlain by gypsum, 200 meters, that's 600 feet of gypsum. Gypsum is solid when it's dry. As soon as you introduce water to it, it's kind of dissolves and creating, uh, creating voids underneath the dam. So this dam was called by the, by the United States Army Corps of Engineers as the most dangerous dam in the world. Do you know what that means? If the dam fails and it has about 11, cubic, 11 billion cubic meters of water behind it when it's full, if it fails, there's going to be a wave 70 meters long, tall. 70 meters, that's 200, 210 feet high. Even the old city of Mosul would be flooded within 20 minutes. Baghdad, which is some 500 kilometers downstream, 400, uh, 350 miles downstream, would be flooded uh, up to about five to six uh, meters of water. The five to six meters, that's 15 to 20 feet of water. Uh, 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 maybe people will, will be ready and they, not many people will die as a result of that flood. But what would happen in fact, is that the entire infrastructure will be covered with water. Louisiana and, 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 and what's the name of that uh, uh, thing that, that rendered Louisiana uh, out of service, uh, New Orleans out of service? Uh, Christina. Christina, I think Christina. Uh, 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 it would be, would be a joke compared to what happened in Iraq. You have 10 million people living without electricity, without water, without, with the sewage, uh, uh, even if the, take out all the cars, uh, take out, uh, how do you provide food for 10 million people? You're gonna have, you're gonna have disease. It is the most dangerous, uh, and in fact, uh, um, uh, I forgot the name of the national security advisor of Bush. Um, she taught at uh, Stanford. Anyway, she, they asked her what- what are Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice. She yeah. said most of them was, was keeping her up awake at night. Okay, so it's that dangerous. So I'm saying, hmm, this is dangerous. So, so Iraq has been grouting the foundation of this, of this dam since 1985. We have no idea how much grout we have put in uh, besides the graft and, and, and what have you. I don't want to go into too much. To, I don't want to bore you with details. But it would be a lot easier to fix this dam if the reservoir is empty. There's hydraulic structure, right? When you have a dam and you have 70 meters of water, that hydro hydro hydrostatic pressure that's going into the soil, you have to go against it when you're pressurizing, right? So if you if you reduce that the the, the the pressure in the in the reservoir, you can hide, you can inject the foundations with 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 grout a lot easier. So what do you do with this water? Well, Turkey is building a Liso dam. If in fact we are reach an agreement with Turkey to store Iraqi water in Turkish infrastructure, okay? We will manage the Turkish, we will lease the Turkish infrastructure to store water for Iraq while we're fixing Mosul Dam. I'm not saying decommission Mosul Dam, I'm saying hmm, keep it in place, fix it so that it's not, it doesn't become the most dangerous dam in the world. Meanwhile, you are cooperating with Turkey on the management of their infrastructure. You're leasing their infrastructure. How do you lease the infrastructure? Well, there are many ways of leasing an infrastructure. You can pay for it with gas, oil, or something intrinsic. 
Turkey is a is is a, you can you can buy the electricity, the entire electricity of the of this dam, and so you can operate this dam. You say you say okay, your dam has an 850 megawatt. Uh, 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 capacity. I will buy that 850 megawatt, all of it, but you will generate it upon my demand. Therefore, that means you have control. You have control over the operation rule of the dam. How do you pay for that uh, electricity? Well, you can reach an agreement. And Turkey might ask for, say, 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Iraq says, no, damn it. This is, you know, if I, if I generate it with photovoltaic, I'll pay only three, four uh, kilo, kilowatt. I say, if we reach the agreement, if we reach the, 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 the table of cooperation, of negotiation about the price of the kilowatt hour, ladies and gentlemen, the game is won because we change the discussion from whose water this is to a bazaar, to dealing. What is the cost of electricity? The game is changed. And by the way, let's say Iraq agrees to seven cents, Turkey says nine, no less, no deal. So we have two cents, two, two cents uh, change, two cents difference. I say, okay, stop here. Give me a break. I'll go to the European Union and say, I say to the European Union, look, it's your, in your interest to promote cooperation between Iraq and, Iraq, uh, and Turkey on the management of this water. Please subsidize this deal with one cent a kilowatt hour. It's a lot easier than uh, taking on refugees. Go to the United States. United States, instead of putting in two, two more squadrons of F-35s or whatever the latest uh, uh, toy you have, why don't you subsidize this deal to the, the tune of one cent a kilowatt hour, because in the end, you will have a method of cooperation between Turkey and a nucleus of cooperation between Turkey and Iraq on the management of the water. And you have begun the trip of reaching mutual trust on the management of water for the benefit of the two countries. That's idea number one. Just like, sorry. Uh, just like I, I convinced Iraq and Turkey to buy electricity from the Iris Dam, we can buy electricity from the entire Southeast or the GAP project. GAP project is the, is the Turkish name for all the hydroelectric dams that they have generated down in, in, South, in, in, in Southeast Turkey. I can buy all this electricity. You're gonna say, why buy all the electricity? I say, Turkey loses by its own numbers. 30 to 40% of the hydroelectricity generated from these dams due to transportation and illegal taps and what have you. If they sell this electricity to Iraq, then you reduce the, the losses from 40% to only 5% because it's right next door to Iraq. And Iraq needs a lot of electricity. Iraq, can, doesn't, Iraq has a lot of brownouts. What Iraq needs is actually improving the infrastructure of transportation of electricity. We lose up to 50 to 60% of the electricity we generate. So there is a need for improving the uh, transportation infrastructure of the electricity. But the point here is, if we actually reach an agreement of buying electricity, we are going to be able to manage the dams and the hydroelectric generation together. And so instead of uh, uh, storing water in Iraq, all that 8 billion cubic meters that's evaporated, we can store that in Turkey and have an 8 billion cubic meters extra capacity more than what we have now. Do you understand the, 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 the uh, this, is, this is the slide that, that explains this. Eight billion, Iraq's own strategic studies indicate that by the year 2035, we will have an 11 billion cubic meter shortage between demand and supply of water. With this one solution, I solved two thirds of the problem, right? If we manage the water of the Tigris and Euphrates together, we will save 8 billion cubic meters or more that Iraq now today loses to evaporation. We've solved two thirds of the problem. Can you clarify how important that evaporation is for the local meteorological? meteorological? Right. So, so, so Iraq, Iraq elevation, Baghdad elevation is what? Uh, I think 60 meters above sea level and it's 600, 600 kilometers away from the sea level. Iraq, so Iraq is a sedimentary plain, so it's, it's rather flat, right? Uh, Iraq's evaporation in the south of Iraq is three and a half meters per year. In the north of Iraq is about 2.7. On average, it's about three, 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 three meters per year. Because Iraq is a, a sedimentary plain, all its lakes are shallow, 
right? So if you have an 11 billion or 50 billion cubic meters and you want to put it in a, in a reservoir in Iraq, the reservoir is shallow. Therefore, the, the, the surface area of the lake is huge. Okay. Multiply, say, for example, take, take the third depression. The third depression has a, a, a surface area of 3,500 square kilometers. 3,500 square kilometers multiplied by three, that's seven and a half billion cubic meters. That's just from one lake that is evaporating on average per year. You take the same water and store it in Turkey, which is only 400, 500 kilometers to the north of you. But suddenly now you're in the mountains. You went from elevation 300, uh, uh, well, elevation of Mosul Dam is 395. Elevation of Eliso is 1,200, 1,400 meters above sea level. By that, temperatures are, lot, uh, are less. So, the, so when the evaporation in Mosul is three meter, the evaporation in Turkey, in, north, in Southeast Turkey, is 50 to 70, 70 centimeters. That is one quarter, right? On top of that, their lakes are very uh, small because they have valleys, right? So you have, it's, it's, like, it's like putting, putting it in a, in, a, in a pot versus a tall glass, right? So the surface area of the lake is smaller. Evaporation is less, so that, 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 and you are losing that evaporation anyway in Turkey because Turkey is storing water. So when you take Iraqi water and store it in Turkey, you're saving for both countries, for the, for the watershed, you're, sa you're, sa you're saving no less than 8 billion cubic meters, no less. So I've solved two thirds of the problem just by coming to an agreement between Turkey and Iraq on management of the headwaters of the, of, of, of the Tigris and Euphrates and sharing electricity or buying electricity. So in my, in my head, I would love to have a company on each of these dams, a public, public go, go, go for an IPO, right? Sell these dams and have them being operated by, by, by its own entities. You have a modern infrastructure connecting Basra and Kuwait all the way to Istanbul, a backbone of electric, electrical, electrical uh, lines, okay? Now, I know, Everybody laughs at Texas and what happened last winter, but that's a lesson that we can we can learn from. You can have each of these companies bid for how much electricity they will sell. We can actually satisfy the demand for Iraq and Turkey from the hydroelectric power in the in Iraq. Sorry, from the dams. Okay, and I'm, I'm, I have a slide for this, but it's now now is a good time to to to, to talk about it. Okay, so, so, so I have hydroelectric power being generated that will create water for both countries, sharing for water, but mostly, mostly I'm building this on top of management of electricity. And in the future, Southern Iraq, and I think I mentioned this last time, I will have forests, forests, not farms, forests of photovoltaic cells in the South of Iraq, because in the South of Iraq, there is 330 days a year of electrical generation. The same photovoltaic cell I install in Turkey or in Iraq will cost the same. But in Turkey, it will only produce for about 120 days a year because they're farther up north. There's a lot of, uh, and, and, and so the, it's, it has to do with the angle of the sun. It, has, it also has to do with, with cloud cover. So I will be in the future producing electricity during the day from southern Iraq. At night, I will be producing hydroelectric from the dams. And I will supply this network with photovoltaic during the day and hydroelectric at night. The extra photovoltaic that I'm generating that is not being sold or utilized, I can use to pump the water back into the hydroelectric dams, creating a battery of a sort. In addition, there is also photovoltaic energy that is going to be extra. And today, if you are following the energy debate in the United States and around the world, hydrogen is becoming the uh, fuel of choice for heavy transport. Um, um, there are there are already the first the first train running on hydrogen cells uh, is online in Germany. It went online last October. The very first buses working on hydrogen cells are in London since the Olympics in London. Okay, so the, 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 the world is moving towards hydrogen as a battery and as a source of energy for large transport. And that's where we have a lot of use uh, 
for many reasons. I, I don't know how much how much have they been teaching you on 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 this. You're civil engineers. You're designing structures and 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 bridges, and you're you're not you're not talking about the electricity, but but you're going to be building the foundations for these. So, but if what I am talking about here is using the management of energy as the backbone for providing water for the entire basin, and more importantly, food. I just gave you the solution for two thirds of the problem by management of the water together. How am I gonna save the extra 30% the extra or 25% left over? I can tell you that Iraq right now wastes a lot of water because we're still using the Sumerian method of, of irrigation. And that's part of the salinization that I talked about. If we modernize irrigation in Iraq from flood irrigation to drip irrigation, we've solved 50% of the, of the last 30%. We also have a problem in Iraq in the sense that in, in Iraq, during Saddam's regime, we had sanctions. And so the Iraqi government uh, began um, motivating the Iraqi farmer to, to plant wheat because they don't want to buy wheat from the outside. And so they paid them with paper and ink. <laughs> And that was fine in, in Iraq's time in, in Saddam's time. Today, the Iraqi dinar is very expensive, right? So today the Iraqi government is continuing the process of buying wheat from the Iraqi farmer at two to three times the international price of that wheat or rice arriving in Basra under the guise of food security. Okay. But that's waste a lot of water. And so what I'm telling the Iraqi government, please change your policy from supporting production. Uh, pr product to supporting the production method. Iraq should be planting vegetables and selling fresh vegetables instead of competing with Canadian farmers and, and Indian farmers and Thai farmers. Uh, you cannot uh, compete with them in, a, in, 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 in the desert, so, but, but you can compete with them by selling vegetables, fresh vegetables to the Gulf. So there's also potential for saving some more water by using uh, sewage treatment. Iraq right now uses the Tigris and Euphrates as open sewers. And there is not a single city in Iraq that has a properly functioning sewage treatment plant. And when the Tigris and Euphrates were flowing full, it, dilution was the solution to pollution. It was not a problem. But today, it no longer is. Therefore, what we need to do is treat the sewage. And of course, we cannot drink treated sewage. Uh, even you in Orange County have a problem with, with, with doing that, even though it's clean. What, what we can do is use that water for irrigation. I just solved your problem for the water with proper water management. So why isn't it happening? There's other, there's other sorts of, of, of solutions. But the major issue here is what I would like to see Iraq and Turkey do is similar to what Germany and France did right after World War II. In 1950, May 1950, five years after the end of World War II, to, uh, Germany and France entered into a coordination agreement on the production of steel and coal. Seven years later, that coordination committee changed to the Steel and Coal Union in which six European countries that were part of World War II 12 years earlier created the Steel and Coal Union. Five more years passed, and Europe created the common agricultural market. And then 20 years hence, the European Union became a reality. I'm not suggesting that we're going to have a Levant Union, or the recreation of the Persian Empire, or the Uthman Empire. What I am suggesting here is that climate change and reduction of oil prices may give an opportunity for the beginning of cooperation between Turkey and Iraq initially. Then I hope Syria and Iran and Jordan and Kuwait and Lebanon and maybe even Israel in the future to create a borderless Middle East based on trade. Each of the countries can maintain its independent political situation, but 
cooperation and codependence is the key to a future peace and stability in the Middle East. And we can build that on the backbone of the management of the water resources. If we have the political vision and the political will. What we don't have is that will. Why? Because Iran is busy building its version or exporting its version of Islamic revolution, Wilayat al-Faqih, since 1978. Iraq before that was trying to export its uh, manly vision of Arab unity and Arab history and Islamic history. Today, Saudi Arabia is ex busy exporting its Wahhabism, which succeeded in getting the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan, but created for us ISIL and Qaeda and bin Laden. Uthmanis are, or Erdogan is, is busy rebuilding the Uthman empire and trying to export his vision of Islamic uh, uh, um, modern Islam. No different than what was happening in Europe at the beginning of the last century, with France trying to assert its hegemony over, uh, over Northern Africa and fighting uh, German ascension, uh, England trying to maintain its empire, and basically it was a zero-sum game of trying to uh, control the resources of this world in order to provide a better lifestyle for, for their own, for their own uh, people. In the end, we had World War I, which actually brought in World War II. Uh, and then after the dislocation of two wars, uh, the countless deaths, the treasure that was spent, the European light bulb came on and said, mm, Maybe it's better that we, we, are be code, we be codependent. Another idea that I did not mention here that I'm looking at my screen, I mentioned the hydro, hydrogen electrolysis, uh, but I did not mention the dry canal. This transportation corridor between the Gulf and Istanbul is basically a path parallel to the Suez Canal. Do you recall what happened two weeks ago with the Suez Canal? Wouldn't it be great if we had actually a parallel path dropping container ships in Basra or in Kuwait and then putting them on trains and moving them to Eastern Europe, cutting two weeks, three weeks off. We can have a dry canal connecting electricity between Basra, between the Gulf and Istanbul, and from there is to Europe. And we can have all sorts of infrastructure that will generate income for the future Iraqis instead of selling oil and bringing in food. I see Iraq as the potential becoming a potential breadbasket for this region and resuming its historic uh, 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 place in produ producing food. We have fertile soil. If we manage water together properly, we can actually have enough water to produce enough vegetables. By the way, Turkey right now wants to, wants to develop agriculture in northern in, in the mountains of Turkey. Well, in the mountains of Turkey, you have maybe three, four months of growth a year. If you take that water and have it in southern Iraq, you bloody have 12 months a year of growth. So why don't we manage the farms of southern Iraq together using private industry, not government industry? All of this is thinking outside the box. All of this are dreams. And those who are very familiar with the Middle East tell me, you're a dreamer. And I admit, I am a dreamer. But I remind you, 20 years ago, I was talking about the restoration of the marshes and people were laughing at me and telling me the marshes cannot be restored. The seed bank is old. People don't want the marshes restored. Guess who's laughing now? And I say, if you're going to dream, dream big. It's free. Thank you. <laughs> so I have questions. Um, Bring I, it on. <laughs> you know, there's students in the, the room here. And so um, this is something I think a lot about in trying to engage with students as well. Um, 
how do you talk about what you do in a way that allows students envisioning themselves doing the kind of work that you do, that you do? What, I mean, you're an entrepreneur when it comes down to it. Um, and there's so much important work to be done in the world like you're doing, but oftentimes those opportunities don't exist for students. Or if, you know, like you have to make, you have to decide that you want to take these risks, move, right? You talked about the impact that you had, it had on your family and all that. So um, what, what advice or guidance do you have for people who care about doing this kind of work, but, you know, fully recognizing what it means to do this kind of work? Is there a way to make it easier? Wow, uh, I'm not, I'm seldom speechless. Uh, <laughs> look, I cannot expect this young generation to be selfless and go out and fix or try to fix large problems. Uh, what I can say is, if you love engineering, you're gonna find a job that you love. Um, you're gonna move up in your, 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 next, your next stage in life as a student is not to go and fix the world. Your next stage in life is to is to find your mate, find your soulmate, have your family or whatever, uh, and, and, and work on your career and move up and learn, apply the tools that you are learning right now. Right now you're, you're learning Runga Kata methods for solving uh, uh, differential equations and you don't know why. Uh, you have no idea, you're, you're being given tools and you really don't understand exactly what these tools are going to be used for. Then you go out and start working and say, oh, Oh, this is what a Dirac Delta function really means. And this is how I can use it. Now, all of a sudden you're beginning, you're beginning to decide whether you really enjoy engineering or not. There's, there's one step, <laughs> right? I mean, you're studying engineering, but more than likely because your family expects you to be an engineer or you've been brainwashed as a young boy, as a young girl to become an engineer. I don't know. I, do, I have two millennials. I have... Once one girl that knew she was going to become a medical doctor and she is now in NYU studying med medicine and she knew she was going to be a medical doctor since she was four years old. And I have a kid, another kid that won't study uh, economics in, in Loyola Marymount, Loyola Marymount right in that next to you guys. And then decided, no, she wants to become involved in fashion and she went for, find your passion. Okay, sorry, I'm going around and I really don't know how to answer you. So I'm, 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 I'm kind of thinking it through. Look, if engineering is your passion, this is how you're going to affect the world, right? If you decide that engineering is your passion and you love doing it, then you will find somewhere in your neighborhood something you like to work. Work in your neighborhood. Fix your own neighborhood. Do not think about the outside world. Get involved. Um, all these ideas that I just told you about require economic models, require eventual design, require eventual construction. There's going to be there's going to be a lot of engineering work that, that goes in implementing these ideas into actual projects. And I'm convinced they will, they will become one way or another. Uh, uh, but for you, I told you last time that the best time I felt as an engineer was in Iraq because I didn't have to plan and plan. In the United States, you have to plan things for 10, 15 years before you build. In Iraq, I do trial and error because it's cheaper. Um, and so I don't know the answer to your question. How do you motivate people? First, they have to fall in love with their profession. Right now, I'm not sure that every one of you guys is in love with engineering. You're studying engineering, you're graduating, you're looking forward to the next stage in life. Find out if you're passionate about engineering first, because, because if, you, if you're unhappy with your job, damn it, that's 70% of your waking time, you're unhappy. Find out whether you actually love engineering or not. And if you do, wonderful. 
then find something that you can apply yourself to. I, I now believe in this, and, and this is kind of fatalistic, but I, I don't know, and the, the older I get, the, the more, the more uh, in tune I am with the Eastern philosophy. Life gives you what you need, not what you want. It's a very deep sentence. Life gives you what you need, not what you want. You might all want a Corvette or I don't know what, 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 turns, uh, what turns you on, but not all of you are going to get Corvettes. But be assured that life is going to give you opportunities and your job is to recognize that opportunity. I could have very easily in 2003 refused to go back to Iraq. Uh, I can see Sam Ali is, is there with, with us. Sam Ali worked with me from 2001 through 2003 on advertising the, the issue of the marshes. Sam decided to stay home. He turns out to be smarter than me. He has a beautiful family and he's, 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 uh, he's enjoying his, his, his life. And uh, uh, I went out and started something thinking that I'm gonna go back to my life in the United States in two or three years. Here I am still. So I don't know, who's, who's smarter? This is Sam or me? I, this, uh, the point is, if he's happy, I'm also happy in my own way. So life gave us what we wanted, what we needed, not what we wanted. I hope that's, that's the long answer, but I don't know whether that makes sense or not. You can't motivate your students, you can only, give them the tools and hopefully they will fall in love with their engineering and, and do something good with it. If they don't like engineering, then if to be happy, find something, find your passion. No more questions? Wonderful. <laughs> Plenty more. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, others should ask questions. I have, I have a lot. Yeah, there's one in the chat. We can start with that one. Um, but I feel before we move on to questions, can we take a quick picture just for the record, right? We wanted that. So yeah, that would be is, great. If anyone is willing to turn on their camera, <laughs> <laughs> that would be lovely. Everybody's in their in their in their use in their bedroom that uh 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 transportable inside the cities it was possible anyway uh, uh, internal combustion engine won that that race uh for large transport diesel won that um all i can tell you is that i can see the logic and the economy now is working towards towards that towards in fact making hydrogen equitable if not cheaper Yep, that's right. Fuel cells were invented just like reverse osmosis, by the way. Reverse osmosis was, was invented for, for the space, uh, the internet, the computer, the transistor, everything was the result. So, you know, if, you, if, if I were you, I'd, I'd, I'd say United States money should, should, should be going towards rever re research and, uh, and development in space. And actually, I don't want to spend in space. Myself, if you ask me where the United States should spend this money, is, uh, is, is in exploring our oceans. Our oceans are unexplored, and they require just as much ingenuity and engineering as space. The person that I applaud the most is Elon Musk with his SpaceX. SpaceX is, 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 is launching 12,500 satellites in the next couple of years making internet accessible to everybody. China and India are trying to control the internet of their own people so they can control information. Guess what? Their answer is Elon Musk. If I was the United States government, I would actually subsidize Elon Musk's provision of, of internet for everybody in China and, and wherever you have repressive regimes. Russia, uh, uh, Myanmar, Wherever they shut down Twitter and 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 Facebook and whatever public media, uh, sorry, I'm going I'm going towards uh, I'm I'm preaching now about democracy and 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 human rights instead of instead of engineering. So I'll shut up. But yeah, yeah, technology is gonna save us. I know 
I know. I know everybody blames technology for the problem that we're in, but technology will also be our, our savior. I mean, go ahead. Sorry, Joseph. Sorry, hey, real quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, before, oh. I think we wanted to take a picture and it was ah. just a good <laughs> trick to get people to turn on their cameras. But <laughs> if anybody <laughs> is uh, wants to turn on their camera and take a picture, we'd love to do that before everyone has to go. Okay, I'll count. <laughs> uh, I'll one, do it. One, two, three. Jeez. <laughs> okay, right. I'll take two. Thank you. Joseph, go for it. Hey, doctor. Um, get, great, great presentation again. It's good to see you. Uh, happy um, Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak. Um, excuse my ignorance. I don't know too much about the situation in the Middle East, but could you give some insight onto why like Turkey, Iran, and Iraq doesn't get along and <laughs> you know, like, what, what, like what's going on and like right. you know, okay. what are some ways they I know you talk kind of about solutions for the water problem being the, the foundation for peace in the Middle East in the future. But I mean, what is the systemic problem? Like, why don't they get along in the first place? I'll start where I think I mentioned it. We are obsessed with history. The difference, if, if you read anything about Shia and Sunnah, that discussion started 1400 years ago and still hasn't ended. It's not a discussion, it's a war between the royalists and the republicans, if you want to call it that. Um, the Persian empire, history started here. So yeah, we have a depth of history and we have inherited 7,000 years worth of historical um, tension. India and Pakistan divided because of religion. Um, here in this sacred land, the land of the Bible, the history records that this area was, had Israel, uh, Jews, then Christians, then uh, the Persians came in actually, and then and the Persians controlled Iraq. Then the Arabs came in from the from Arabia with Islam, and this area became majority Muslim. And then the Uthman, it, it, layer upon layer of invasions coming back and forth, exchanging culture, but also uh, the historic tensions remain. Why do they continue? I can I can almost hear your 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 brain going it's like enough already. In the United States, fifty years is history. Well, to us, fifty years is yesterday, right? I mean, if we're still discussing something that happened fourteen hundred years ago, uh, what's fifty years? Fifty years is just yesterday. Um, right now, what's happening is that we have politicians that are trying to revive past or trying, Saddam Hussein, for example, for 30, 40 years, uh, tried to compare himself to Nabhud Nusr. Uh, Nabhud Nusr is the person, the, the Babylonian leader that went into Israel, uh, Judea, and brought down the temple and brought the Jews as slaves to, 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 to Babylon, right? So he was trying to compare himself to Nabhud Nusr as the person that's gonna bring Iraq back to its former glory. By the way, incidentally, the last time an Iraqi, an actual Iraqi person from Iraq, Sumeria, ruled Iraq was 2,500 years ago, right? Persia came in control for about 800, 900 years. Then Arabs came in, uh, Quraysh controlled it either through Umayyad, Umayyad or Abbasid uh, uh, empires, and then came the Uthmanis or the Tatars, and then again, we have, we have our history, this land, our history is basically for the last 2,500 years, we've been controlled by foreigners. So I, 
I don't know whether this answers your question or not. Um, why don't the people rise and, and change, right? I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, our history, we drink history, we, we, we live it, we, it's in our blood, uh, but uh, why don't we change? That's, that's, that's a good question, I don't know. I, I, I don't have the answer to you. All I can tell you is describe to you that there is on-site tension right now between three different forms of Islam, Shia Islam, Ikhwan Muslimin, and Wahhabism, uh, trying to, to, to assert dominant, dominance. Um, and the way it's going, the way I'm looking at it, Iran is winning the game, uh, despite the fact that it has sanctions on it and, and its economy is, 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 is getting really worse. And I mean, uh, if, if I want to be political, I want to condemn sanctions as a weapon. The United States should stop using that. Uh, it hasn't worked with Cuba. It didn't work with Saddam. And I don't think it's going to work with Iran. Sanctions is a weapon that is used against the people by the, own, by the, the, the same powers that we want to uh, change. I mean, sanctions are not hurting the Iranian regime, it's hurting the Iranian people. Sanctions did not hurt Saddam Hussein, it hurt the Iraqi people. It made, it made, it made the Iraqi people even more dependent on Saddam for their income. Anyway, so I, I don't, I, I want to stay away from politics, but it's too late. I'm, I'm right in the middle of it, uh, giving you my opinions. So uh, there, <laughs> sorry, I can't keep my mouth shut. This is going to go on the internet too, so <laughs> good luck. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say thank you for the insight. Um, yeah, me being, um, my parents being immigrants from Vietnam, I think the last time I said that I had a calling to go back home, but, you know, being a child of immigrants, I felt like my entire culture was kind of taken away from me. And, you know, I have like this hyphen. I disagree with you. I disagree <laughs> with you. You are, you are, you have in your soul the two cultures. You are the perfect person to translate Vietnam to America. And more importantly, explain America to Vietnam. Um, I, I disagree with you vehemently. I am a perfect vehicle. I understand the West completely, and I understand the East completely, and I can translate both ways. I guess you um, kind of like, cut me off because, like, that's kind of what I was trying to get to. Like, <laughs> we're on the same page there, and since so, what I'm saying is, like, my roots is like I felt like it was taken away from me, but I was also given a gift. Of being able to speak both languages and so you know you're very um inspiring um i i want to know like about the history of my people and you know just like kind of hearing about the history of your people and how it goes back so far like for me it's like the past 50 years as you said the united states it's, it's kind of all i know the past 100 years but there's thousands and thousands of years of history and culture that i have no idea about and uh, you know, you inspired me to learn about it. So I just I want to say you thank go, you. You should, go, you should go and live in Vietnam amongst your relatives for a while. You'll, you think you know Vietnam now, but you will know a lot more once you live, live uh, amongst them and understand their ways through living with them, through sharing with them the food, uh, through looking at... I, 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 I thought I understood Iraq. I understand it a lot better now. Uh, having shared meals and, and, and talks about what happened during the sanctions. Um, listening to an old fisherman describes to me the ways they used to fish, the 21 different ways that he used to fish. There's a lot, there's a lot to be learned from these simple farmers. There's a lot. Yeah, I just really want to say um, say again, yeah, thank you for being so inspirational, for taking time, especially during Ramadan, to do this for us, especially in Jordan. So thank you again, and uh, happy Ramadan. And like, like my, my invitation is still there. Next time you're at UCI, let's, let's grab a beer. And we can have like the real deep talks that's not on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm actually uh, what you see, what you see, what you see here. I'm, I'm, I, I got nothing to hide. I'm, 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 I have no aspirations for political office, and so I can be as free as I can. Uh, I'm, 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 you know, freedom of thought is guaranteed. You know, that's a privilege that you definitely have. But me being 
you know, a staff engineer at Converse Consultants around for like 75 years, you know, shameless plug. It's like I have to represent my company. <laughs> you're, 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 you're at Converse? You work in Converse? Yes, sir. And so, ah. you know, so you, you know. I'm glad uh, they're still around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk um, uh, again. Thank you. Again. So appreciate right, it. Right on. All right. Anybody else? Ready to roll? All right. Did uh, Stephen have a question? Oh. Oh, I thought Stephen was about to speak. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're good. So um, right. thank you again. Happy Ramadan, Ramadan Mubarak. I will see you around UCI, guys, when life returns to normal. Cheers. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everybody.